Okay, some, some worrying trends in the emerging data-driven society. The problems of the world are complex. We all know this. There's climate change, there's financial, economic and spending crisis, there's um, conflict, war, mass migration, terrorism, and many other problems. But maybe the most difficult problem and the most pressing one to solve is the lack of sustainability. This is a problem that we know of actually since about 50 years. And when the Limits to Growth report came out, the world was still sustainable. But what happened then really got the world out of balance. Rather than saving energy, it turned out that not only globally were we consuming more energy, but also per capita. And this is not going to end with the digital revolution because as you can see over here, it's going to consume more and more energy. The predictions of the limit to growth were actually quite concerning. They said that basically in 2020, we would see a downturn in economic production, basically a collapse of our economies. And later on, um, a population collapse. And that's the reason why you can actually find books such as this one, Learning to Die in the Atropocene. We are faced with very difficult, in fact, existential challenges. And that's the reason why people are talking so much about ethical dilemmas and the trolley problem. As you've certainly heard, this has been an issue in connection with autonomous cars. And there has been also this MIT experiment called the moral machine experiment that was asking if the car couldn't stop, should the car rather kill a grandma or some unemployed person? This is quite shocking. And it becomes even more shocking as in fact, there was a TV show, a Big Brother show that was actually asking viewers to determine the value of a human. That was actually at the time when the pandemics was just starting last year. And some people proposed that <clears throat> young people should now basically be prioritized and old people should die. I hope that with this forward, you're seeing that we are confronted with really serious problems and that we need to take difficult decisions. The digital revolution somehow claimed to have the answers and solutions. We're now living in a big data age. Huge amounts of data are being collected. Purposes are found later on. There are many reasons to do this or excuses as you like. Data is the new oil, sustainability, security reasons, and knowledge is power. You're all aware that we're living in a surveillance society, secret services around the world are collecting huge masses of data. That means not only the Googles and Facebooks are collecting a lot of data, but this data is being put together by the secret services. In fact, um, basically most relevant communication that we have through the internet is being surveilled given that videos are basically uh, consuming most of the capacity of the internet. It's not just the NSA that is collecting huge amounts of data, it's also the CIA and probably the Russian Secret Service and Chinese Secret Service as well. CIA Director Gus Hunt actually said, you are already a walking sensor platform. It is really very nearly within our grasp to be able to compute on all human generated information. And this includes what we say. It's possible to identify you based on your voice through somebody else's smartphone. And the former Google CEO said, we know where you are. We know where you've been. 
we can more or less know what you're thinking about. This needs to be taken very seriously. It was even the idea to create something like a digital crystal ball and the hope that we could see what is wrong and where the system is broken and fix it. And these kinds of digital crystal balls have been built by some companies and also the military and Big data analytics is run there in real time. And there is the belief that humans are actually quite predictable. Some claim even more predictable than elementary particles, which I find pretty ridiculous, I should say. But somehow the big data paradigm has been formulated by Chris Anderson, who said, if we just had enough data, then we wouldn't need scientific methods anymore. We would see the end of theory. That kind of approach, as we know today, has a number of issues. The magical formula that more data means more knowledge, more power, more success doesn't necessarily hold. It's quite difficult uh, to figure out how to connect the dots, how to re refine raw data. And there are a number of problems that I will skip through very quickly, uh, which is sensitivity of data and predictions in particular, because of finite confidence intervals. Even we don't know how the world population will develop in the future, peak oil, uh, oil prices, global warming. There's a lot of variability in the predictions. In particular, it's difficult to identify turning points and tipping points. There are classification problems, and those are actually quite concerning when they uh, concern our own health or lifetime. There are quite some applications which are concerning. Angela Jolie, for example, has basically had the best uh, removal based on a genetic test, even though she didn't have any cancer symptoms. And that should have been a new business model. Fortunately, scientists basically pulled the emergency brake on this because this is quite a concerning business model people could actually stay healthy, right? Then there are a number of um, issues related to convergence of machine learning and AI approaches. And maybe those algorithms may not converge at all, or it takes a lot of time to converge. And actually, as we have found out recently in connection with traffic light control, which is an MP hard, optimization problem. It turns out that machine learning does actually not perform that well. It consumes a lot of energy though. Then Sorry if I interrupt, Dirk. Yeah. I, I still don't understand what you're going, going to tell us. <laughs> I'm a bit worried that we, you know, you are telling this for the whole, whole hour. No, I'm, I'm through this very quickly. I'm saying that we're basically applying a method as a new way of governing the world, even though it has a number of serious issues. That's the point. With overfitting, for example, and that could also lead to the conclusion, to conclusions that could be quite wrong. For example, when it comes to correlation versus causation, Often those two are mixed with each other, confused, and uh, there could be spurious correlations, random patterns in the data that are actually meaningless, but would basically have an impact on the way our society is being controlled. And there's bias and discrimination, as we've also seen recently. And this is bias against a large um, fraction of the population. Now, these kinds of methods are increasingly being used to run not only companies, but also society, the health system, um, and many other areas of our society. So a new data-driven society is basically run based on 
um, methods that are sometimes questionable, often very trans intransparent and not controllable by citizens and scientists in many cases. We're now living in a surveillance capitalism uh, where basically companies are increasingly controlling what happens in our society. So while before capitalism was kind of a subroutine of our society, which was a democracy, democracy is now becoming, that's my impression, a subroutine of surveillance capitalism. That means we have really a fundamental change in the way our society is operating. We've never decided democratically about such a change. A lot of this is based on profiling. Digital doubles are being created, in many cases without our knowledge or against our will. Those profiles are highly detailed, go up to the level of behavior and psychology in our health. And those digital doubles are then being used to simulate the world, to come up with scenarios which are then implemented by social engineers uh, and would basically try to control our behavior and the course our society is taking while we don't know who are these people, how are they qualified, are they complying with ethical norms with the constitution and so on. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, what's an example for scenarios being implemented by social engineers? Um, you will see this uh, shortly when I talk about targeting and when I talk about uh, the kind of health system that is currently emerging. That comes in my second part. Okay, thank you. We are also seeing a new economy. So part of it is the attention economy. We're overloaded with information. And in this way, in a sense, distracted from important points, but also basically our attention is captured and guided and to some extent controlled in the sense of companies and, and those social engineers that I mentioned. So the profiles that are being created about us by mass surveillance are being used to target us with personalized information, not just for the purpose of marketing and just to give you an idea how much manipulation is out there, I'm going to show you a search for some of my own books on Amazon, which actually I can't find if I don't put in my full name. If I just put my last name and the title of the books, those are not actually coming up, at least when I'm looking for that, which is very strange. You know, in, in the Netherlands, they're even changing my name so I don't find the books at all. So there's a huge amount of bias in that digital system that's being created, which means that as everything is personalized, all the products and services that are being offered on the internet, you're excluded from a large share of the offerings that other people would get and you're not even aware of this. So there's discrimination as the business model in a sense. Then there's behavioral manipulation. Tristan Harris who worked in a Google control room even calls it mind control. And he thinks billions of people are being manipulated every day. It's been used to manipulate election outcomes. This is personalized AI which has been developed for military purposes, but is now being used also for marketing. And it basically exploits cognitive biases of human beings that have been mapped out and basically digitized in order to be able to manipulate and trick us. And we are now basically the experimental uh, animals in a sense. So we're being experimented with 
Every day there are millions of experiments that those digital companies do without our knowledge. In China, they go even a step further by basically introducing the infamous um, citizen score where every behavior would be rated with plus or minus points and then basically this would be used in order to control people's behaviors and what they still can do, whether they can book flight tickets, uh, uh, fast train, public transport at all. All of that is being decided by the citizen score, which is behavior based and of course very much discriminated. The concerning thing is that censorship and propaganda is happening not only in authoritarian countries such as China, it's also coming our way. So I've observed it several times where my own appendices, for example, have been blocked, where certain kind of uh, web links have not been accessible, where uh, people have been warned to open appendices, even um, a YouTube video on implications of AI for human dignity has basically been blocked. Of course, the issue of propaganda is an old one and it has been particularly important for the Third Reich. Now we have personalized propaganda and it's much more effective than any propaganda we've had in the past. This is why we have this fake news pandemics in the world. We now have deep fakes of what people say and uh, even of videos that are so realistic that it's becoming increasingly impossible to distinguish whether the source of information is true or has been manipulated. We also see a new legal system forming and digital policing is at the core of that. Lawrence Lessig said, code is law. Basically, algorithms are increasingly determining what is possible and what not. And it's being used to determine so-called criminals before they have even done a crime. And the error rates, that means false positives of these approaches are often above 99%. So there's a lot of arbitrariness. I find this a very dangerous approach because it could be heavily misused. And despite those high error rates of those approaches, this has become part of the COVID response, where, for example, in Israel, the tools, mass surveillance-based tools to track terrorists have been basically applied to tracking uh, corona positives, I mean, people who would be infected. In some countries, infected people were actually treated like terrorists. That means those predictive policing methods are now being used in connection with the pandemic. By the way, it didn't work well in Israel and elsewhere because yeah, the process- I really, I'm really worried. I mean, I, I'm wondering when the introduction stops. I really would like to hear the paper. I'm a bit worried about that, I have to say. I don't know whether I'm the only I think we need a discussion about a system, right? And we are seeing a new system being formed and we've never had a discussion whether that's the, the right thing to do. Yeah, I think we should uh, give uh, Derek the possibility to complete his paper. He has prepared it in the way he has prepared it and it's more an overview paper rather than a paper about a concrete research project. I think that is, uh, so we'll have this review paper more or less an overview about, you know, some of the tendencies that he observes. And I think we still can then later on in the discussion see, you know, how we can, you know, uh, compare it with a 
whatever evidence we have. So Derek, if we just continue and just, you know, another 10 minutes so that we do have some time to, to have a you know, really fruitful discussion. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. So in, in fact, now big data is also being used for um, life death decisions. And this is particularly concerning in the context of 11,000 experts that have um, basically signed a declaration that uh, suggested that um, we would need to reduce the population of the Earth. There are, in fact, scientists who have been working on computer-based euthanasia. And we are now seeing digital tools being used for triage decisions. I mean, basically, um, life death decisions are being taken now with these kind of digital means. Those approaches often are trying to predict expected lifetimes and as you cross these predicted lifetimes, basically the health support by the health system would be dramatically reduced. The consequence is that this is creating a self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense. And also it would on average cut lifetimes and it would have social selection effects and eugenic effects. In fact, it's not only my own judgment that this is the implication of the new big data-driven medicine that's emerging at the moment, but it has also been found by historians that what is on the way is, is very much alike a eugenics approach as we have seen it in the past. In fact, you may have noticed that China has been first to apply many of these big data-driven methods I've been talking about, but China is now being accused of gen genocide exactly for such reasons. I personally find those developments remind in a concerning way of what we have seen about 80 years ago. You may remember that um, in Nazi Germany, digital approaches have, or computer-based approaches have actually been used in, in order to organize, for example, the Holocaust. And here, the idea would, uh, was that basically society would be treated like a body and those parts that would be considered ill would be removed. And that would basically mean that people would be killed. Now, these planetary health approaches that we are now seeing increasingly, or population health approaches, they're going extremely far. So first of all, they include all the people in the world. So the, the entire world population shall be improved by methods that actually include highly sensitive personal data about persons, medical, criminal justice, socioeconomic histories and behavior, mental, environmental and genetic information. I find this is actually, this has the potential of being highly totalitarian. And a lot of these developments go now towards neuroeconomics, where we have neurotechnology being used in order to potentially be able to, to read thoughts in the mind and also to manipulate the mind. This sounds like science fiction, I know, uh, but it's something that has been supported by the American government, for example, and it's heading towards what some people call neurocapitalism. So, Brain tech is basically coming around the corner. Human brain indexing is seen to be a huge business model. And there are concerns by 
people who are well informed about those trends that this might be a direction our society may take that we may not want to see. That means a society is forming here that we may actually not want to live in. Now, it seems like this kind of society is almost there. This society would be really largely data driven. Data would be collected in huge amounts by the internet of things. That data would be basically transmitted by Li-Fi, a single LED diode that I think is capable of transmitting eight gigabits per second. And with particular kinds of satellites, enormous amounts of data would be sent around the world. That would be processed by quantum computers. And then basically a world control system would become feasible if we basically made sufficient simplifications. I mean, replace all the NP hard complex problems by uh, simpler approximations. That means a lot of complexity would be just squeezed out our reality. Now, this kind of system is in the making right now. You've heard that um, a consortium of companies are pushing for what they call a great reset. The governments have been advised about what those companies think should be done in order to prepare for future pandemics. This kind of preparations foresee that entering any building space or country would require a full health screen to prove you're not carrying any infectious diseases. Companies have been partnering up to build consortiums that are actually quite powerful. I mean, here you can see that all the big companies in, in terms of hardware, software, data, big oil, banking, insurance are basically building data centers together that, to enable this kind of new society. And the Internet of Things would be so pervasive that it would actually also be distributing sensors in our bodies, health sensors in a sense, nanoparticle-based sensors that would then report data to that Internet of Things. So these are all very serious sources. Despite Switzerland has recently turned down the private EID, we are now seeing that basically the same thing is being pushed forward now through this so-called Infpass, a vaccination certificate. We are being told, we werden uns im Laufe dieses Jahres und der nächsten Jahre in gewissen Bereichen nur bewegen können, wenn wir belegen können, dass wir geimpft sind. So basically, the agenda that I explained to you before is now official politics. Now, once we introduce this and we have this personal ID, it basically makes it possible that AI systems would control people similar to objects. And this is actually the exactly the thing which is in total opposition to human dignity, according to which we shouldn't be treated and managed and administered like objects. In fact, the most important things for humans are things that are not well measurable by data. And that means a data-driven society would squeeze out those things that are really important for humans and humanity and that is the main concern. So with, with this, I'm basically ending. If you want to know what's the further development according to some visionary people, then there would be a human machine convergence. Humans wouldn't be distinguishable from machines in the future. 
And some people even think we would upload our brains to the cloud. Of course, that hasn't to come this way, but it very much depends on us to change the future if we want a different future. So with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. I've shared my concerns. If you want to see a different digital future, then I recommend you to have a look at this book. With this, I'm very much looking forward to a discussion with you.